Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, we're happy to have Elliot Tenshalevitz from RPI. Um, his topic is very topical these days and uh, a lot of interest here, so I'm glad that the talk will be recorded so we can uh, look more at these problems because I think these problems are going to be central for a long time. Please, Elliot. Uh, okay, so. And it's going to be a talk uh, about games and social networks. All right, so the idea is, uh, let's say we have some social network, you know, so the nodes are people or whatever, and the links between the people represent relationships or collaborations or friendships, something like that. Okay, so imagine there's a big social network, and, uh, which I didn't draw, and we're this green person. And these are my friends, so I just do the links that are next to the green person. Okay, then the green person like all of us, have a, has a problem. That problem is that you can't possibly put 100% effort into every single thing you're working on, or 100% effort into every friendship that you are participating in. So we're going to model this by saying, OK, this green person has a one unit of effort. And we're going to allocate this one unit of effort amongst all the relationships that they're involved in. So for example, it might do something like this. So here, uh, maybe this green person puts 60% of its effort on this relationship or this collaboration. So it's working really hard trying to you know, make this relationship succeed. And maybe this person puts 20% on this one and this one. OK, 20% is actually kind of a lot. But you know, think of it like put some small amount on those two. So what it means is that the green person on, in this relationship or this collaboration is just sort of putting in just enough effort to push it forward. Not really working that hard, but just putting in enough so to make sure it keeps going. And then these two friendships, the greens person is completely ignoring, just letting them take their own course and is putting in no time at all. So this is, I mean, this is a pretty common problem <laughs> that occurs to people. And uh, okay, so what will happen if, let's say that this is, this is a particular link, so this is a relationship between two people, orange and green, and what happens if they both put in a lot of effort into this friendship? Well, presumably what should happen is this relationship will succeed. If it's, a, if it's a collaboration, they'll publish lots of papers or something. Or if it's a friendship, then they'll both be happy and they'll both uh, become good friends and get a lot out of this friendship. So they'll both be happy for, because of it. What happens if uh, neither person puts in very much effort? Uh, well, as you know, unfortunately a lot of us are familiar, if neither person works very hard at a relationship or a collaboration, it will just die. Uh, Eventually, I mean, maybe not for a while, but usually it will fizzle out, nothing will happen. If nobody's really trying, neither person will be very happy with it. And finally, okay, what if one person puts in a lot of effort? In this case, the green person puts in a lot of effort, the other person doesn't put much in at all. Uh, well, then the answer sort of it depends. It depends on the kind of project or kind of relationship or friendship that it is. Uh, sometimes, I mean, it's possible that actually they'll both still be quite happy because of this. It's possible that this, this, uh, this collaboration will succeed, even though this person's not putting in much effort at all. They'll both be reap rewards, and maybe they'll both be pretty happy because of this. So it sort of depends. OK, we're going to try to model this as generally as possible, or at least I'll try to be as general as possible. Uh, so I'm going to say that, OK, so let's say that this, is, this edge is, let's call it E. So for every edge E in the graph, we're going to have some reward function. So what, so what I mean by this is with a function f sub e. So it could be different reward function for every edge. And it's going to take in x and y. So x and y are the efforts that the two people are putting into this project or into this relationship. So this function takes x and y and spits out how successful this friendship is. Spits out how you know, their success or the number of papers or whatever, how happy these people are with this friendship. So it's an arbitrary function of two variables. But uh, we're not going to try to, we're going to try to not to assume too much about it. We're going to say, okay, this function is going to be, it's non-negative and it's non-decreasing in both variables, right? So if you put in more effort, you should only get a better relationship or better, 
collaboration, not worse, right? Uh, I, I hope that's true. It doesn't have to be symmetric. You are assuming symmetry of I was just about to get to that, exactly, yeah. So this function doesn't have to be symmetric in x and y. But then what happens is, so both efforts go into the function, the success of the project comes out, and then both people get that benefit. So I am assuming exactly that this, the success of a project or the benefit of a project is the same for both participants. You could imagine, in fact, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the talk. You can imagine if somehow there's a total amount of benefit and they're dividing it among these, amongst themselves or they get to somehow unequally. That's not what this talk is going to be about. I mean, there's some extensions we can talk about, but that's not what this talk is about. In this talk, it's, you think of it like, uh, you know, they publish some paper together and both people get the credit. And if paper is good, they both get the credit. Or you can think of it as, you know, they're doing this project together and their boss sees the outcome of the project and the boss sees, hey, you did well, you both get you know, promoted or something. Uh, the boss doesn't realize that, you know, this guy didn't do almost anything. <laughs> but that, that's how it is sometimes. So yeah, for this talk, the assumption is they both get the same benefit from, from the edge. Okay? Okay, so this is sort of the, the, the introduction. This is the setup. Now let's actually talk about uh, what is the actual game? Let me define the game that I'm going to talk about. So the game is as follows. Okay, so we're given an undirected graph. This is the social network. We know exactly what it is for this kind of talk. So we're given the entire graph. The players in the game are going to be just the nodes of the graph. So every node is a player. And so for example, maybe here's a very simple graph with three players, right? And each player has a budget of effort. This, this is the budget they're going to allocate amongst all the edges they participate in. Now, the budget can be different. So here we have budgets of you know, 5, 10, and 8. Why is the budget for different players different? Well, I think it's very natural. I mean, I can make them all be the same. Actually, some nicer things happen if they're all the same. But I think it makes perfect sense for me to be different because I certainly know people with very different levels of energy. And you, some people can put in a lot more effort than others in total. And if you talk about something like friendships, I certainly know people who spend a lot more time in their social lives than others, so I think it makes sense for their effort levels to be very different. And we're given the reward functions. Okay, in this case, the reward functions are very simple. They're like 3 times x plus y or 2 times x plus y. In general, they can be arbitrary reward functions. Okay, so this is what we're given. And uh, okay, what are the strategies of the players? Well, it's exactly what I said. Each player is going to take their budget of effort and divide it amongst the friendship it participates in. So to put this into some notation, although I don't think we'll ever use this notation in this talk, but just to make it formal. OK, so each node is going to, OK, let's this node, for example, takes us 10 units of effort. And I say, I'm going to put in 4 here and 6 here. And in fact, you'll, you're never going to really keep some effort to yourself. You're going to use it all, right, because the, the functions are non-decreasing. So there's no reason to, to keep it to yourself. Uh, and okay, to formally write, it contributes some amount to each edge, such as the total amount that contributes at most the budget. Okay, is there a question? <laughs> okay. No, so there's no benefit to just relaxing. <laughs> In this model, no. Uh, that's a very reasonable extension to have, actually, which I'll, I'll try to mention at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in this case, yeah, it's a budget constraint as opposed to like an elastic constraint. So here, this is just a total budget, and you want to spend it all. Okay, so this is what happens, uh, right? So people choose how to allocate their effort. And now that they allocate their effort, we know what the rewards are going to be for every edge, right? 15 is just 3 times 4 plus 1. Oop. So now we know what the rewards are going to be for every edge. And then what's going to be the utility of a person? Well, it's just going to be the total reward they gather from their edges. So, it, so in, to put it another way, this person's going to get 15 plus 22. And to put it into you know, formal notation, the utility of each node is just going to be the sum over all the edges that's sent to them of the reward in those edges. So that's, that's all that means. Um, OK, so that's, I mean, that's the game. So notice that the utility, the reward of a particular player depends, OK, it certainly depends on how they allocate their effort. It also depends on how their neighbors allocate their effort. But it also sort of indirectly depends on neighbors of neighbors and so on. So for example, like you can imagine, okay, so imagine there are some other nodes here. This node over here decides to put a lot of effort on the edge with this node. 
And now because I put a lot of effort here, this node labeled 8 might say, you know what? I'm going to put a lot of effort here too. It depends on the kind of reward function. And now that I put a lot of effort here, that means I'm subtracting effort from here, and now this person is, uh, is worse off. So you can have this sort of behavior where one, what one person does affects the neighbors, which affects the neighbors, and this propagates, and various dynamics, and so on. Uh, and, and that, okay, another thing to notice since we're looking at this picture is, uh, well, the reward functions are different, right? So here, even though, so because of the reward function here has four and here has two, right? Even though people are putting in less effort, you get 28 instead of 22. And that certainly makes sense. Reward functions should be very different because what do reward functions represent? One of the things they represent is compatibility, co com compatibility of the pair of people. For example, uh, if two people are very compatible, then a little bit of effort might give them a lot of reward. If they're not very compatible, then even a lot of effort is not going to give very much reward. So, so it makes sense that here, the reward is higher even though there's less effort. Okay, so this is the game. Any questions? OK, so that's the game. Uh, now, what are we going to look at in this game? Well, I'm going to look at very stable solutions, think about their quality and how to find them, and uh, whether they exist, and things like that. So I'm going to look at equilibria. So I can start by looking at Nash equilibria, but actually, uh, I'm going to try to convince you that Nash equilibria aren't very interesting here. OK, so first, what do we know about Nash equilibria in this game? Uh, we know quite a lot. We know pure Nash equilibria always exists. We know there's a potential function that, uh, that matches best responses, which means we know that people always converge to Nash equilibria, which is doing best responses. We even know that the optimal solution, that is the one of maximum social welfare, is a Nash equilibrium. So we know a lot of stuff. But they're not very interesting. They're not quite the right concept to use here. Just to, here, let me give you an example. So looking at this example, let's look at this edge. So imagine you know, a thousand, I just put a thousand, that's just some big number, times x plus uh, x times y. So if that's the reward function here, then really what should happen is that both of these people should put some effort onto this edge, and they'll get a huge reward. But in the solution I drew here, this person is not going to move any effort onto this edge, right? Because, well, from this person's point of view, if I move some effort into this edge, how much reward is I going to get? Zero, because the other person didn't. This just shows there are some bad Nash equilibrium. This just shows there's some bad Nash equilibrium. No, the best ones are still, are still not uh, but the best, ones, it, the, the best one is as good as a social optimum. Uh, so, I mean, it, it depends on you. So, if, if you want to say, OK, imagine a single edge. Right, where both people are contributing nothing to the, to the, to the, to the edge, where the function is something like this. Then Nash equilibrium, where they contribute everything, that's Nash equilibrium, that's the socially optimum. But the equilibrium where they contribute nothing is also an equilibrium, because you need to have both of them to do things, do things together. This, yeah. I mean, this is something that often occurs. This is something that often occurs. Uh, this is something that often occurs, but some equilibria are really, really bad, some equilibria are really good. So price of anarchy is very different, price of stability. Yeah. So that's the question. So, well, this is, why, this is why these links exist, right? If they don't know each other, they, this link shouldn't exist, right? So, 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 I mean, feel free to disagree. My view here is that I think for this kind of game, Nash equilibria don't quite make sense because in real life, whatever that means, I think these two people who know each other because there's a link between them would actually talk to each other and say, you know, if we just both increase our effort a little bit, we'd both get a huge reward. And so I think they would do that. Or to put it another way, I'm going to look at coalitional equilibria. And I mean, if you like Nash equilibria in this game, well, I, I just told you about all the results that, that are known. So quite a lot of things are known about Nash equilibria as well. But here's what I'm going to do in this talk. I'm going to not look at Nash equilibria. I'm going to look at the, I think, a more interesting concept for this game, and that's Pairwise equilibrium. Okay, so what is pairwise equilibrium? Uh, okay, so just to define some some pretty usual terms, a unilateral improving move means that a single player, a single person, can change their effort allocation and improve their utility. A bilateral improving move means that a pair of players can both change their strategies, can both change their effort allocations at the same time. And both of them strictly improve their utility. 
Okay, so Nash equilibrium is exactly something that has no unilateral improving moves, no single player can deviate. A pairwise equilibrium is exactly something where, which has no unilateral or bilateral improving moves. So every pairwise equilibrium is also a Nash equilibrium, but not vice versa. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna, so most of the results that I'm gonna tell you are actually gonna hold for strong equilibrium as well. A strong equilibrium is even a stronger concept than pairwise equilibrium. In fact, that's why it's called strong. It's a really strong concept. Okay, so it means that no coalition. So pairwise equilibrium means no pair will deviate. Strong equilibrium means no coalition, no set of players, including all the set of players, will deviate such that every single person in the set will improve. Yeah. It's, okay, so what is a core? Core is you have a coalition and they pool their money, right? it's transferable utility, and they deviate such that the total utility goes up. Strong equilibrium means that there's, it's non-transferable utility, so each person has to improve. So strong equilibrium is, is the equivalence of the core for, non for NTU games, for non-transferable utility games. Um, yeah, and the games I'm talking about are non-transferable. means that every person has to improve. It's not somehow that they get together and pool their money. I mean, I guess it's not so easy to do with friendships or with credit from papers. You can't quite say, like, if that, oh, since, we're, since you're all better off and I'm worse off, I won't necessarily be happy. You want that everybody improves. Okay, sorry, uh, any more questions about transferable utility and non-transferable utility? Okay. So, in this talk, I'm going to look at pairwise equilibria for this game where you partition your effort amongst your neighbors. I'm going to ask these kind of questions. OK, first of all, I'm going to ask, do uh, pairwise equilibria even exist here? So as I mentioned, pure Nash equilibria always exists. That's easy to show. But a pairwise equilibrium, as you'll see, doesn't always exist. But I'll show you when it does. I'm going to ask questions about the price of anarchy, which in this, for this talk, I will mean the ratio between the social welfare in the optimum solutions, what's the maximum social welfare possible, and the worst pairwise equilibrium. So that's what I mean by, yeah. So that's what I mean by price of anarchy. Price of stability, although I'll, I can also give bounds for optimum solution versus the best pairwise equilibrium. So you can ask me afterwards if you want. What do you compute? Yeah. Optimum, you're actually going to add up all these non-transferable things. Right? This is social welfare. So social welfare is the total utility of everybody together. Uh, which is in, in a, I mean, which is essentially the, the friction right between total happiness and happiness of particular people, because social welfare might go higher, but a particular person might not like it, which is why they would deviate. So, yes, <laughs> but I can, but I mean, uh, I think I can see your point also. So, so we're going to look at price of anarchy. We're going to look at the computation, which is this pairwise equilibrium. Even when it exists, can we actually compute it? And we're going to look at, basically, can the players compute it? Meaning, are there some nice, reasonable dynamics where players just take turns deviating or something, which will actually converge to pairwise equilibrium, when they exist, of course. So this is the kind of questions I'm going to look at in this talk. Okay, let me mention, very quickly, let me mention some related work. So first of all, there's a lot. This is and many more. I mean, social networks in general, and games and networks, I mean, all this is a huge area. There's lots of stuff that's related. Ask me afterwards if you want to know more. But let me mention a few of these things. All right, so even things like stable matching. So a utility maximizing version of stable matching is actually an integral version of a very special case of our game. <laughs> so there's, even, there's some relationship there, um, which you'll actually see uh, probably when, towards the end of the talk. Network creation games. Okay, there's a lot of network creation games of all kinds. Uh, probably the most relevant network creation game to this is the co-author model from 1996. Uh, in this model, I mean, there's lots of differences. In this model, you, you don't spread effort among edges. You, so, you sort of choose, you, you, you construct edges. So you form an edge is either there or not, as opposed to having some effort on the edge. Um, there, they have a complete graph instead of some, some given graph. Uh, they have uh, very specific kinds of reward functions. They have different notion of pairwise equilibrium. Lots of differences. But still, I mean, I think this is the most relevant version. And there they also look at pairwise equilibrium because they want people to be able to form edges in pairs as opposed to 
sort of one person forming an edge and the other person later saying, okay, I'll do it too. Okay, so the game I mentioned, this contribution game, is technically a atomic splittable congestion games. For those of you who know congestion games, congestion games are a big, very big field with lots of results known. Um, atomic splittable congestion games are usually sort of the most annoying ones to handle. And there's lots of differences between what we're doing and various congestion game results. Uh, for example, usually in congestion games, people care about Nash equilibria and minimizing cost. We're looking at uh, pairwise equilibria and maximizing utility. Of course, maximizing utility is different from minimizing cost when you look at price of anarchy. If you look at optimal solutions, uh, it's the same. How are you splitting the atoms here? Uh, so, <laughs> so atomic splittable, it's, it's, I, I didn't make up this term, right? So atomic splittable means that each person controls some big amount of flow, in this case effort, and they can split it amongst, amongst different parts of the network. Big, uh, atomic, it's called atomic to differentiate from non-atomic. Non-atomic means that each person controls an infinitesimal amount of flow. So something that approaches zero, and therefore non-atomic. I, I didn't make up a name, this was not. But yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there's many other differences. Uh, like for example, that usually the delay functions in congestion games, uh, which correspond to reward functions in this game, are some function of x plus y, well, in our case, they're arbitrary functions of two parameters. Okay, I should mention some public goods and contribution games just because they have the words contribution games in them. These are very different games, although I think they're very interesting and there's lots of cool stuff in there, but they're very different. Here's how. In those games, each person uh, has one number as their strategy. So you just decide how much you want to contribute to society as a whole. So you don't like say how much I want to contribute to each project or each relationship, you just figure out how much do I want to contribute to society. And that's your strategy. And then depending on how many people contribute, you know, various nice things happen. But, uh, but I think it's actually a very interesting area. Finally, last thing I'll mention is uh, minimum effort coordination games. So one of the reasons why we started working on this topic is because of minimum effort coordination games. These are, in fact, a bona fide special case of the games I'm going to talk about. These have been studied in various economics papers, um, usually experimental. So nothing was proven about them until, I guess, this work, or almost nothing. Uh, although, but some very interesting experiments were done. Some of them on actual people, as opposed to simulation, and I think they're pretty cool. So okay, what are minimum effort coordination games? It just means, it's, it's, it's essentially the game I mentioned, but the reward functions are of the form min of x, y or maybe some function of min of x, y. So it's the minimum of the contributions that matters, and that's well. So you can see how they'd be much more structured because of that, and, and many more. So this is all I'm going to say about related work, uh, at least today. So let me tell you then a little bit about the results that, that what do we know about these contribution games, basically. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk about various properties of these games depending on the type of reward functions that are present. So as you probably can see, which re what the reward functions are like can make a huge difference. For example, if the reward function is like convex, then it kind of means I want to put more of my effort on the same edge. If it's concave, you kind of want to spread out your effort. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to classify various properties, specifically existence of pairwise equilibrium and price of anarchy, depending on the type of reward functions present in the network. So, for example, suppose that all the reward functions are convex. They don't have to be the same function. They can be different for every edge. But suppose they're all convex. Okay. Then, pairwise equilibrium always exists, well, with a caveat. So, pairwise equilibrium always exists if both people have to contribute a little bit of effort to get non-zero reward to every edge. If this is not true, then it may not exist. And in fact, it's anti hard to figure out, given a graph, if it exists or not. Okay, so that's existence. And I'll tell you a little bit more about, about this, this result in a moment. Uh, let me just go into price of anarchy. Price of anarchy here is always two. So all pairwise equilibria are within a factor of two of the optimum solution. Great, except there's a caveat, <laughs> again, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But this, this is only true if the reward functions all exhibit strategic complements, I'll tell you what this means uh, on the next slide. 
so annoying. Uh, I don't like these caveats, but I mean, that's 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 the truth. So, so that's that's how it, that's that's, the, that's how it is. Okay, let's go to what if all the reward functions are concave? No caveats here. So here, it may not exist. There may not be any pairwise equilibrium at all. But if it does exist, it's within a factor of two of the optimum solution always. Okay, the next thing is uh, I like this special case. Uh, it's sort of a uh, very nice structure special case. This is when all the reward functions are x plus y times a constant. So this, and the constant can be different for every edge. But other than that, all the reward functions are the same. Why would you put all of your budget in just one edge? In this one? Yeah. In this one, you, you would, well, if, it, if the C's are the same, you would spread it. This is actually a very easy case. Here's what happens, right? So first of all, perseverance is one. That's obvious. Each person is almost independent from the other person. We're just going to put it all in the edges of best CE. The only reason I'm putting SF here is, uh, is, is I think this is interesting. So pairwise equilibrium may not exist, given a graph. Natural equilibrium always exists, remember. But pairwise may not. I can convince you why, but okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe afterwards. Uh, the basic reason is, I mean, is that pair is deviating, right? So even if they're getting a very high reward, like they put it on the maximum CE, they might still want to move their effort to each other, and the reward will increase by uh, by twice the CE, right? Because I'm putting stuff here, and they're putting stuff here. And the reward goes to both. That's, that's my you know, two-second version of why. So if you didn't get that, that's OK. Um, so, it, so it may not exist. But figuring out if it exists or not is efficiently solvable. And it's, I think it's kind of a cute algorithm for figuring out when it exists. So this is why I put that up here. OK, let's go on. Minimum effort games. OK, remember minimum effort games are things. Uh, so what I mean by this is that all the reward functions are something like convex function of min of x, y. Then, well, OK, this is the last caveat, I promise. Uh, so, so here, again, uh, uh, pairwise equilibrium exists. The price of key is 2 if all the budgets are uniform. So if all the budgets are the same, and be hard otherwise. By the way, notice right, this is not a special case of this. So like this 2 doesn't come from here. And this yes doesn't come from here. Because minimum, so convex of min is not convex. Right, so this is not a special case of this. Of this. Minimum effort concave is concave of min. OK, concave of min is concave. <laughs> so this just comes directly from here. So that part's easy. Uh, but now we have this. So the, the fact that it's not concave of min gives us the very nice statement, which I'll try to tell you about uh, in, in a few slides, that now pairwise equilibrium always exists when it didn't before. OK, maximum effort, uh, is, frankly, is boring. I'll just include it for completeness. It's not very interesting. It's not very hard. I think this part is slightly more interesting. If you want to look at approximate equilibrium, the, the optimal solution, the one with maximum social welfare, is a two approximate equilibrium, two approximate pairwise equilibrium, meaning that no pair can switch and both increase their utility by more than a factor of two. That's it. So optimal solution is nice. OK, uh, so these are the results. I mean, there's other things which I won't mention, like, OK, price of anarchy bounds are tight. Uh, there's price of stability results. But I sort of promised I would tell you something about convergence. And I'll tell you very quickly the idea and try to give you the details if I have time. OK, so here's what we know about convergence. Okay, here there's two check marks. What that means is things are really nice. In this case, basically whatever deviations or whatever dynamics you choose, they're going to converge to pairwise equilibrium if it exists, of course, and they're going to do it really fast, like n squared time. Here, check, there's only one check mark, so things are not as nice. That means that things will converge, but they might take them a very long time to actually get to pairwise equilibrium. Although pairwise equilibrium always exists, so they will get there eventually. Here. Things are sort of weird. Um, the answer is kind of yes and no, and I'll tell you about that at the end, because I think it's sort of an interesting case. Okay, so in the remaining time, what I want to do then is give you an idea of, of why some of these things uh, are true. I'm going to start with, with this uh, red box. Okay, so really, there are two theorems here. The first one is, if the reward functions are convex for all edges, 
And if this thing holds, meaning that for every edge, both people, people have to contribute at least a little bit to get positive reward. So I guess it should say Fe of x0 equals Fe of 0, y equals 0. So if you don't contribute anything, uh, if one of the people doesn't contribute anything, then there's no reward. Then pairwise equilibrium exists. Otherwise, it may not. In fact, it's going to be hard to determine if it does. The second theorem is if all the functions are convex and exhibit strategic complement, then the price of anarchy is token. So what is strategic complement? I guess let me tell you in words first. It's going well, to mean this, <laughs> but why this? Uh, strategic complement is a pretty standard uh, term in economics, probably most of you have heard it before. OK, here's what it actually means. In words, it means if I put in more effort, then your incentive to put in more effort only goes up. So the more I do, the more you want to do. A strategic complement. OK, so what does it mean for how do we write that for a function? It's just this. So the second mixed derivative is non negative. But strategic complement is the opposite of strategic substitute, where if I put in more effort, your incentive to put in more effort goes down. Okay, so, so this is strategic complement. This is a reasonably standard thing. You look like you have a question? Okay. <laughs> so, so if x increases, the derivative of y. Well, that makes perfect sense. It sounds a little bit like some version of modularity. Yeah, it, um, it's, uh, uh, it's a version of, I mean, it goes up, right? So it's a it's, it's a, I mean, Logs. Unfortunately, convex doesn't mean what you want it to mean. Like, really, if I had my choice, maybe this is what convex would mean. Because <laughs> yeah, it means, like, but anyway. Um, OK, so, so for, I mean, what things have to, uh, follow strategic complements? For example, these functions all exhibit strategic complements, right? Any polynomial, actually, with positive coefficients is going to exhibit strategic complements. So for all of these, this theorem will hold. And for these two, they also satisfy this thing, which means it will also Pairwise equilibrium will always also exist, but not for these two because, in fact, I can give. I mean, just if you look at a triangle with reward function being two, being two to the x plus y, pairwise equilibrium doesn't exist. But when it does, price of anarchy is two. Okay, so let me give you an idea of why these theorems hold. Okay, the first one's actually quite easy. So here's an algorithm in the, for the first theorem which creates a pairwise equilibrium. Always take your edges. Sort them from highest weight to lowest weight, where by weight, I just mean, OK, if both participants put all their effort on this edge, like all their budget on this edge, then that's their reward of this edge. So that's, say that's the weight. Sort them from highest weight to lowest weight. And now just do a greedy matching. That's it. That's a pairwise equilibrium. So it's that easy. And it's not even too hard to see why it's a pairwise equilibrium. Um, so that's theorem one. Theorem two uh, is going to use some of those ideas. So if you're familiar right, with, you know, if you look at the greedy maximum weight matching, it's a two approximation to the actual maximum weight matching. So I don't know, how many people here are aware of this? I mean, hopefully a lot. So, so if you're familiar with how that works, the idea is going to be actually the same. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of details and stuff, but but that's the basic idea. So if you know that, this is going to seem, I mean, this is going to seem quite familiar. So, okay, so let's see why theorem 2 holds. OK, so theorem 2. The first thing to show, which is going to actually allow us to use this greedy matching argument, is that there always exists an integral optimum solution, meaning that, so by integral here, I mean that every player spends all their budget on a single edge. So for example, this red solution is an integral, whatever, integral optimum solution. So we can just consider this solution instead of other optimal solutions. And why is this? This is basically because of convexity and because of uh, strategic complements. Because you're going to have more and more incentive to put all your stuff on one edge. So that, yeah. but optimal, I, in this talk, by optimal, I always mean, I mean both the other objectives as well. But in this talk, I will always mean uh, highest social welfare. Yes. So highest sum of utilities. Anyway, so this is the, let's say this is the optimal solution. Now let's look at a pairwise equilibrium. Let's say this, so, there's no similar result for pairwise equilibrium. Pairwise equilibria might you know, be, look like this. They might not put all their effort on a single edge. So let's look at this pairwise equilibrium, compare it to the optimum solution. OK, well, we better use the fact that it's a pairwise equilibrium. So for example, let's look at this edge. Consider a deviation where both of these players take all of their, all of their effort and put it on this edge. So from the green solution, 
conservative deviation where we take all the effort to put it on this edge. Since it's a pairwise equilibrium, that means one of them doesn't benefit. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a pairwise equilibrium. So which one doesn't benefit? Let's say it's this one. Let's say it's the one on the left. OK, so what does it mean that they don't benefit? It means that their utility, their utility in the green solution, which I'm going to draw like this, must be bigger than the reward they would get if both of these people put all their effort in this edge. In other words, the reward of this edge in the optimal solution. So this green circle, the utility of the green person, uh, uh, utility of this person in the green solution is bigger than the reward of this edge in the optimal solution. Now we can do this for every edge of opt. We're never going to have the same node being pointed to by two different arrows. That's because of this claim. Because to be pointed to by an arrow, it means that I'm spending all my budget on that, on that arrow. And I'm only spending all my budget on one edge. So because of this claim, each node is pointed to by at most one arrow, which means we sum this up. What do we get on the left? We get the sum of all these green circles. That's the total utility of the pairwise equilibrium. So total because we sum up all the utilities. On the right, we get the sum of these red edges. This is the total reward of all the edges in the optimum solution, which is exactly opt divided by two. Because the reward of an edge goes to exactly two people. Okay, that's it. So it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, I'm leaving out some details and this, but that's pretty much it. Okay, so that's, so that's why this result holds. That's why the convex stuff holds. In the remaining time, what I want to do is tell you about this right here. I think it's pretty cool. So basically, if you have concave functions, they may not be pairwise equilibria. But once you look at minimum effort concave, we'll always have pairwise equilibria. And I'm going to show you why. OK, so just to remind you what are minimum effort games, it means that all functions are of this form. So there's some function h sub e, could be different for every edge, of min of x, y. So h sub e is a single variable function, right? Because it takes a min of x, y. So if and Concave minimum effort games means all these h sub e are concave. So if we have general concave functions, like square root of x, y, for example, is a general concave function, there may not be pairwise equilibrium. In fact, again, on this very, very simple game, there's no pairwise equilibrium. You can verify that yourselves if you want. But once you look at minimum effort concave, for example, functions like square root of min of x, y, there's always a pairwise equilibrium. In fact, for this game, there's a very simple one. Just spread everything out half-half. Uh, Every person just puts half-half effort. OK, so the actual theorem is the following. Pairwise equilibrium always exists. If the functions, if it's a minimum effort games and the functions are concave, and they're continuous, and they're piecewise differentiable. I don't, I don't think that assuming continuity and piecewise differentiability is too much to ask. OK, so now I'm going to show you how to construct a pairwise equilibrium in this case. I'm going to do basically a, a well, yeah, so I was going to mention, OK, if we can compute it to arbitrary precision, not just to prove its existence. If the functions are strictly concave, then it's unique. Perseverant keys two is by different proof. And uh, yeah, so, so what, about, what is it about minimum effort games that really helps us? Well, the answer is, I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's the min. But specifically, what is it about the min? In a minimum effort game, where the functions are something of min, in a pairwise equilibrium, people are never going to have unequal contributions, right? Because suppose you're contributing more than somebody else, but your actual reward depends only on the min. I mean, you might as well just contribute the same amount as them. And that's, I mean, that's the obvious observation, but it's going to turn out to be enough. OK, so here's sort of going to be sort of a, yeah, sorry. Yep. Surely it's not needed. It's needed in my proof. Um, but if you have solutions for, I mean, so the question is a stability question. If you have solved it for some functions h, and, mm -hmm. A giant, they converge uniformly to another one h. Doesn't that imply that the equilibria will, will converge? If, if, I mean, maybe. If they're increasing and if they're, if they're converging to a particular function. Yeah. I don't know. Any I, concave yeah. function has only countably bad. So, I mean, I used it, but I, I haven't, frankly, I haven't truly tried to get rid of that assumption because I figured it was good enough. But, uh, sure, but only, I can try to think of how to get rid of it. Only best mathematicians would ask you about that. 
<laughs> no, but I mean, I, it might not be too hard to get rid of. So it, it's, it might be worth thinking, uh, but not at this second. So, <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to just give you basically. I'm going to show you how the algorithm to compute a pairwise equilibrium works on this, and that should also prove to you why pairwise equilibrium always exists. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Um, now that I mentioned that uh, the contributions of both sides are always going to be the same, because, right? Because it's a min. Uh, really, what I mean here is like it's not three squared x. This is three square root of min of x y. But I'm just going to write it as three square root x for compactness. So really, it's three square root of min of x y. Okay. So here we have this graph with budgets, and these are budgets. These are reward functions. Okay. So what do we do? First thing we do is for every node v, let's compute the best its best response. So the best strategy it could do if it were able to control all the other nodes. So this is the best thing you could possibly do ever. Right. There's no way it can get better utility than this. So for example, for this node, this is the best thing you could possibly do, is it would put, you know, it says budget is one, so this adds up to one, put four 14s on this edge, and it would make this node match its offer, and then, that's, and then it will get you know, two square root of four 14s. So this is the best thing it could do, ever. Okay, so first, so how do we figure out what, you know, what this is? Well, I mean, we can just do this. We just do this by solving a convex program, right? Because what is this? This is we're maximizing the sum of concave functions due to a linear budget constraint. We can do that using a convex program. But uh, there's a sort of a better, more intuitive way to think about what these numbers are, and that is right, is that, well, on all these edges, right, the derivative should be equal now. Of course, because if one derivative on the one of the edges is higher than the other, you would just move some effort from the, uh, from the lower derivative edge to the higher derivative edge and, and improve your utility. So the derivative must be all the same. And so one way to compute it is sort of intuitively is you look at these concave functions, you start putting effort on the ones with highest derivative, and you keep doing this and until, uh, keeping the derivative the same until you, uh, until you come up to the derivative being the same everywhere. There's a few annoyances, like for example, here, we're assuming that this person will match the contribution. Well, they can only do that if they have enough budget. If they don't have enough budget, then they can't match the contribution, even if we make them. They just don't have enough budget. But those are details, and they're not that important. OK, so for, every per so for this person, there's actually a derivative value associated with them, which is the derivative that it, it has on all these three edges. So we do this for every person. So now we've computed the best strategies for every, per uh, for every node in the graph. And each node has a derivative value now. And you can believe me that these are the best. OK, so what do we do next? We pick the node with the highest derivative value, which in this case is this one. And we fix its strategy. So this is going to be its strategy. This is going to be its effort contributions in the final solution we end up with. Uh, and that works just fine. The problem here arises, what if there are several nodes with the highest derivative value? And then uh, you can't just pick an arbitrary one. You have to be extremely careful about which one you pick. So this is what I mean by there's a sort of a crucial tie-breaking rule. Say if there's several nodes with highest derivative value, you better pick the right one. And, and there's various things in there. But if there's only one node of highest derivative value, you just pick that one and you're fine. Um, so I won't really talk about this. I'll, I'll leave this out. But, uh, but in this case, this is the only, only one of highest derivative value, so we fix its contributions. Okay. Now we do the same thing again. We compute the best strategy for every non-fixed, so for every gray node, if it were able to control all the other gray nodes. So this one is fixed. It's done. But we compute the best strategy for each node if it were able to control all the non-fixed nodes. Uh, so for example, so here's what it becomes. It, these are the new strategies. So notice one nice thing about this, right? Here, this person said, I want to uh, put one effort on here, and you're supposed to put one also. And that's what happened. Well, if only that was so easy. Uh, here, this is what happened. But it's not true that if we just compute the best strategy for this person, if it were able to control all of these, it wouldn't necessarily put one here. It might do something quite different. But there's this lemma, which really just comes from the fact that we're doing this highest derivative and because we're doing the correct tie breaking, which is, it's true, not every best response of this person where it could control all these people actually matches the contributions of the fixed nodes, but there always exists at least one, which I, I don't think is surprising. This is what, especially once you think about this highest derivative stuff. 
And so we picked that one. So we, we can always pick contributions of these people which will match the contributions that have already been fixed. So that's what we do. OK, and now we continue. Fix the strategy of a node with highest derivative. In this case, it's this one. So we fix the strategy, and we'll go on. So now we do this again. You know, what's the best strategy of this person? If we, if we control all the great people, do this for everyone. We get these strategies, and we keep fixing them one by one, and eventually we get this solution. And the lemma is not very easy to prove. The lemma is sort of where you have to use a lot of stuff. But once you get this, I claim this is a pairwise equilibrium, and this is actually very easy to see. Here's why it's a pairwise equilibrium. OK, so suppose it weren't. Suppose maybe this pair of nodes would rather deviate. So we could deviate together and get better utility, both of them. Then I claim the node that was fixed first would not wouldn't deviate. OK, so in this case, this is the node that was fixed first. Well, why wouldn't it want to deviate? Well, it's very simple. So, OK, so why would it want to deviate together with this other person? It's because, why, why would you deviate as a pair in general? It's because by yourself, you can't improve your utility. But if you both do something different, then my utility will actually go up. But because of this lemma, because we reformed the solution, this node is actually getting the best utility it could possibly get if it could control these four people. So it's getting the best utility it gets if it can control all of these people, which is certainly going to be better than the best utility it gets if it can control these two people. So it's already doing really well, so it's never going to want to deviate. And that's it. So it's, that's why it's a pairwise equilibrium. OK, and that's, that's it. That's the, the gist of why pairwise equilibrium always exists. And as I, as I said, we can then use results for general concave function to, sort of, to show that the price of anarchy is at most two. So there's always a nice pairwise equilibrium. In fact, all pairwise equilibria are within a factor of two. OK, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about here. And I guess I, I promised uh, at some point that I would, okay, uh, I would talk about this question mark. So uh, to wrap up, let me talk a little bit about this question mark, then I'll mention some you know, future work and stuff as usual. OK, so, so here's what this question mark means. I already told Nikhil about this. So, <laughs> so this question mark. Uh, means the following. In minimum effort convex games, even when a pairwise equilibrium exists, so like when these three stars hold, for example, if you do best response, there may not be any path from, the from your starting point by doing best responses to a pairwise equilibrium. So let me, let me uh, define what I'm saying. If you look at the state graph, right, so, so each node in the graph is a state, and a transition in the graph is a pair deviating, in the best, uh, and both of them improving their utility. So then the path in this is just a path in best response dynamics. So for here, there are examples where there's a nice pairwise equilibrium sitting right here, but we start right here, and there is no path to get from here to here by using best response dynamics. So it will just cycle. But not only will it cycle, there is actually no path to get from here to here. So best response dynamics are not going to converge, and in fact, you can't even make them converge if you tell them how to deviate as long as. But here's why I think it's an interesting question, why it's a question mark and not just a no. If instead of doing best response dynamics, if we, instead of doing deviations where both people improve strictly, you allow deviations where one person actually gets a better utility, but the other person's utility stays the same, then at least so far, I have no examples where this doesn't converge. I don't have a proof or anything. But so far, every example I come up with, it always seems to converge. Somehow it says that for this kind of game, being sort of a little bit altruistic, so uh, saying I'm, I'm willing to switch as long as I don't lose anything, but also if I don't gain anything, makes a huge difference. It somehow causes convergence to happen, which I think is really interesting. I don't know why yet, because I have no proof. Okay, so that's what this question mark is. Yeah, yeah. Is it a superset of this system? No, uh, no, it's, it's, exactly. It's a superset of this response. I'm adding more transitions, right? So before we had only transitions where both people must strictly improve, and there's no path from here to here. Now I'm also adding transitions where only one of the people can improve and the other one stays the same. So I'm adding more transitions to the graph, right? There's more deviations possible now, so there's more possibility for convergence. But, but you're right, but, but there's still paths which will cycle. 
but that's only if people choose those. If, it, it seems like there's always a path to go from here to, uh, to a pairwise equilibrium. Okay, so to say this one more time, it's not true that every path will now lead to a pairwise equilibrium. There are cycles in the dynamics. But it is true that there seems to always be a path to pairwise equilibrium when there wasn't before. So if, I, I have, if I did, I would have a proof. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, so it's quite possible that doing some sort of random best response dynamics where you don't take the same, you know, if you run your cycle, you don't do the same one again, maybe that will converge. I don't know. Yeah. I'm missing something. Sure. You, you, so utilities are going up. Yeah. Utilities are uh, utilities are going up for this pair. For other people, pair. Like yeah, that. for this pair, but not for other people. Um, so right, right, right. Yeah, right, the right. two of us deviate. Yeah, go up. Yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> All right. Then the, let me just mention. So on the last slide. Let me just mention some uh, extensions and what I think are interesting open problems here. Okay. So first of all, uh, certainly, you know, I talked about convex and concave. I think it would be interesting to look at specific classes of reward functions, especially ones motivated, hopefully, by some specific application, and see what the behavior is like then. Uh, also, I talked about these best response dynamics, but there are many different kinds of dynamics, which I haven't really looked at. Uh, you know, imitation dynamics, and uh, all kinds of random dynamics, and no regret dynamics, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so one thing that I have looked at is general contribution games. What I mean by this is, OK, so, so far, this was a graph, right? Each of these relationships is a pairwise thing. What if instead of a graph, it was a hypergraph? So for example, what if you have projects which, with many participants? And then the k participants get together, and they all put in some effort, and then the reward function takes in k inputs and spits out how good the project is. So in other words, what if it's exactly the same game but with a hypergraph? In that case, a lot of the same things actually still work out. So all the well, forget about maximum effort. Maximum effort doesn't work out, but like I said, maximum effort is kind of stupid anyway. So um, all the existing results work out in the same way. The price of anarchy changes, unsurprisingly. So here and here, it becomes k, where k is the size of the largest project. Not surprisingly. Here and here, right? Remember, this actually came from here. So. Um, Instead of two, you, you don't even get k. You get some, like, I think you might be able to get k squared, but you get something really annoying. Unless you assume strategic substitutes, which is the concave, right, which sort of means concave, or supposed to be concave, and then you get two again. So you don't get k, you actually get two, but, with, but you have to make some extra assumptions. So that's uh, general contribution games. Um, and here's a few things which they seem, maybe seem like minor differences, but they actually cause pretty big differences to the results. Okay, so one thing is, I want to look at um, there being capacities in the maximum contribution to an edge. So you shouldn't be able to put all your budget on an edge. There's some maximum amount you, you, of effort you can contribute to an edge. That changes things, but uh, you can still prove versions of the results I mentioned. The really interesting thing, which is the main thing I'm actually currently working on in this area, is this, cost functions for generating contributions. Here's what I mean by this. I mean, actually, what, what you asked earlier, uh, and that is, instead of a budget constraint, instead of a hard budget constraint, what if you have some cost function for how much effort you put in? So the more effort you put in in total, the more cost you experience. So now there is a benefit for you for relaxing, because now you, you don't have to pay as much cost. And that changes things quite a bit. Uh, sometimes. I mean, uh, in minimum effort games, doesn't change things too much. If you assume everybody has the same cost function, then you can still prove some results. But in general games, yeah, totally different. Yeah, you think it a loop, Yeah, that's what you do. Uh, technically, if you think of it as a loop, it's slightly different. Um, but uh, yeah, it has to be here too. But, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it means. It just means there's a, you're allowing loop edges. Um, and minimum effort, it's not that bad because you're both going to be, again, you're both going to be putting the same amount, and so it's going to be just a function of this. And uh, basically, the, the amount you're putting on the edge is going to be the same for both of you. And so if you have the same function, then your difference because of this edge is going to be the same, and you can use that symmetry. But if you have different functions on every edge, like different cost functions on every edge, or if you have different, uh, if you have, you know, over here, yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on. So that's pretty much open. I think it's very interesting. Finally, sort of the big thing that really changes everything is uh, what if instead of 
both people getting the same reward, what if somehow you divide the reward? Or maybe the reward go, is divided proportionally to the effort you put in or things like this. That we're only starting to work on. And, and the, I mean, then there's lots of different cost-sharing schemes you can think of. And, and I think it's a pretty cool question. Anyway, that's, if you have any more questions, please ask. I'll stop here. <laughs>